end of our little slideshows, our glorified slideshows, which means the end of the semester is near. Uh, hooray, hooray. Nationalism and political identities in Asia, Africa, and Latin America is the subject matter for today. Uh, quoting, as always, to start with from Professor Bentley, uh, the lovable author of our textbook, European empires still appeared to dominate global relations, but the Great War, World War I, which we know something about by now, had opened fissures, like cracks, within the European and U.S. spheres of influence. Beneath colonial surfaces, nationalist and communist ferment brewed. Uh, resistance to foreign rule and a desire for national unity uh, were stronger than ever. Uh, so uh, this uh, right uh, picks up on some uh, themes that we've already uh, encountered. Uh, colonialism, uh, nationalism, uh, and communism, uh, right? Some of the isms, uh, which we've been talking about for quite some time now, uh, we'll be talking about them even more. First, India, uh, and India's quest for home rule. Remember that uh, by the early to mid-19th century, India had been uh, more or less a colony, possession of the British for a few hundred years, uh, by this time, a couple hundred years at least, uh, and uh, in the 19th century, into the 20th century, there was a growing nationalist movement uh, that was pushing for, at first, home rule. Uh, home rule usually means uh, some form of autonomy, uh, something short of complete independence. Uh, so this is like what Canada had done, as we've seen uh, in 1867, around the same time that the uh, Indian uh, National Congress obviously, was pushing uh, for the same. It took them a bit longer. Uh, but Canada uh, got its complete independence by steps and stages. So this is what's happening here. Many of the leaders of the Indian movement for home rule had the ultimate goal of achieving complete independence, uh, home rule being uh, an important uh, step along the way, a big step uh, along the way. Uh, uh, Professor Bentley again says... Indian nationalism threatened the British Empire's hold on India. A European system of education familiarized the local middle-class intelligentsia, uh, meaning sort of the uh, uh, children, uh, usually uh, only males, uh, got to uh, be in government. Uh, uh, intelligentsia means sort of the professional class, professors, uh, bureaucrats, etc., usually college-educated, uh, with the local with the political and social values of European society. Those values, however, democracy, individual freedom, and equality, were the antithesis of empire, and they promoted nationalist movements. So, uh, what's uh, Professor Bentley saying here? Uh, what he's saying is that the Europeans, uh, the British in this case, in India, uh, had to rely, did rely, on large numbers of Indian civil servants. There were tens of thousands of British civil servants, but running a country the size of India uh, required far more than the British had, uh, uh, you know, in terms of their own civil servants willing uh, and ready to go to India. So um, they uh, provided education. Uh, in some cases, members of the Indian upper and middle classes traveling all the way to uh, Great Britain to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, Gandhi, who we're going to meet soon enough, uh, uh, did this, uh, got a law degree uh, at the uh, Inns of Court uh, in London, uh, and so he was one of that kind of elite class. But Bentley is saying more than that. He's saying that getting that Western education, uh, European education, whether in Europe or getting a version of it uh, in India, uh, also inculcated uh, those students, Indian students, with the values uh, of uh, Britain uh, and the larger European society, democracy, individual freedom, and equality. Uh, and when those values rubbed off, uh, you had sort of a natural move to nationalism. Uh, a desire for freedom, democracy, equality doesn't square well uh, with uh, empire, uh, being, uh, you know, belonging to someone else. Uh, your country and your people being owned and governed by someone else. So the very values that the uh, Indian upper class and middle class picked up uh, with a European education led to nationalism and opposition to empire. The Indian National Congress, 
formed in 1885. This is the original meeting right here. Uh, the photograph uh, even says that. Uh, so uh, it's twice on our slide here. Uh, and it says it a third time. Uh, in 1855, uh, uh, not 50, but 73 men were found ready to serve as representatives from every province of British India in the first annual meeting of the Indian National Congress. This was the organizational vehicle for India's first great nationalist movement, embodying the dreams and aspirations of New India, uh, as it was uh, being termed. So uh, the desire, the dream uh, of independence, uh, uh, right? the idea of independence, the ideology of nationalism are all well and good, uh, and they can sort of get you somewhere, but you usually need some sort of institutional basis for which you can sort of organize all that energy and all those ideas, all those feelings, uh, and sort of make it uh, more effective or, or make it actually happen in the real world. Uh, and so the Indian National Congress ended up being that body and that institution uh, for uh, India itself. So nationalism was already there to some degree, or it wouldn't have been formed in the first place, but the Congress itself then uh, you know, inspired even uh, greater nationalism and went out and uh, lobbied uh, and you know did the political activism uh, throughout the many provinces uh, of this gigantic uh, country uh, to get more and more Indian people on board with the idea of home rule and eventual complete independence. Mohandas K. Gandhi, uh, one of the most legendary figures uh, in all of uh, 20th century world history, uh, he has uh, you know, a mythical reputation uh, um, to this day, uh, and uh, um, some of that reputation he deserves. Some of it has been turned into myth. Uh, uh, nobody is you know, a perfect individual, uh, but this guy did have quite a few saintly qualities to him. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, Gandhi did come from the uh, the privileged classes in India uh, and was able to parlay that into an education uh, in England and a law degree uh, from England, which he then sort of brought back uh, uh, to uh, India uh, after a stop in South Africa. Uh, and uh, But he sort of quickly got into political activism, political protests, uh, first for Indian rights in South Africa. There were a lot of Indian immigrants, uh, were poor uh, low-paid workers uh, in South Africa who were being abused by the white uh, racist government there. Uh, and so uh, Gandhi uh, was there for a number of years uh, and became uh, um, sort of by putting himself in that position uh, and through his skills and ability, uh, the leader uh, and political sort of defender uh, of uh, Indians' rights uh, in South Africa. Uh, which annoyed the hell out of the white authorities in, in South Africa. They put him in jail a couple times, uh, uh, but in the end, they compromised with him because Gandhi was a shrewd customer. Uh, again, he did have a saintly side to him, but he also had sort of the clever lawyer-politician side to him as well. So uh, don't let the, uh, the uh, ascetic look here uh, fool you. Uh, right, uh, wearing just sort of a robe and uh, uh, you know being a man with few possessions, and that's what ascetic means. Not many possessions, uh, and it looks like he's sort of simple, uh, and a monkish uh, type uh, individual who's always and only contemplating God, which he was doing. He was a uh, you know he was uh, by the time he started dressing like you see in the pictures, uh, he was uh, becoming more and more spiritual, more and more religious. Uh, and becoming more of a religious type figure, uh, almost a messiah-like figure. But don't, uh, again, let that fool you. Some of that's true, uh, as you'll see in the quote even. Uh, but uh, he, he always sort of uh, was uh, part that and part uh, the shrewd lawyer. Gandhi, it says uh, in uh, the book mentioned below, found fresh application for his technique of nonviolent resistance. Uh, this is uh, you know after coming back from South Africa and f first doing it there, uh, and then applying the same methods uh, in India, uh, in you know being the uh, le the leader, at least the figurehead, but more than that, uh, of the anti-British uh, movements uh, in uh, uh, India. So uh, as long as he was sort of the most famous and the most powerful member 
uh, of the Indian nationalist movement, and he was, though there were some other brilliant uh, uh, people like Nehru uh, there with him uh, at the top, uh, it was going to be a non-violent movement. Uh, uh, he called this uh, uh, you know, non-violent resistance, uh, uh, not, uh, uh, he's called it non-cooperation as well, uh, but uh, he did think of it as resistance. Sometimes people call this passive resistance, but Gandhi was adamant that uh, there was nothing passive about it uh, and told his followers, who were growing by leaps and bounds uh, know, by the year, in the early years of the 20th century, uh, that uh, uh, you have to be very brave and courageous to be part of this movement because though we're not going to commit violence, for, we're for sure going to have violence committed against us all the time. Uh, but we're going to turn the other cheek like Jesus and we're going to take it uh, and not strike back. Uh, and uh, that might seem like a, a pretty lousy way to try to uh, protest and get anything done, uh, but he believed that uh, by doing it that way, it would generate publicity. Uh, the publicity uh, would generate respect, and not just in India, but around the world. People sort of say, wow, these people are really uh, committed uh, to their independence from Great Britain because they're willing to get beaten up and even killed uh, without even striking anyone back. Uh, and so they, they kind of, uh, and uh, Gandhi understood this uh, well uh, also, uh, and that is that uh, it gave them sort of moral authority. It gave them the moral high ground over the British because the British were committing violent acts against them and they weren't doing it back. Uh, so uh, in, in a, more or less it worked, though it's not the his uh, leadership, uh, the Indian National Congress's leadership, uh, and the sort of uh, methods of nonviolent resistance and non-cooperation aren't the only reasons that India eventually did achieve home rule and then independence. There's some other factors as well, but it was a big part of it. Uh, so he fra uh, found fresh application for uh, non-violent resistance, always traveling third class, meaning uh, he didn't you know, travel in first class train cars, and, uh, dressed as the poorest peasant, again, an ascetic lifestyle that he led. The Mahatma drew crowds and attention at every platform stop, reaching India's masses as no politician before him had ever done, embracing poverty and suffering in his own person, experiencing daily the plight of the lowest of the low, becoming their guru, not just another political leader. His was a potent charisma for India. No other appeal uh, had as much force as a religious one. So uh, he basically lived the life, at least in terms of uh, uh, standard of living uh, of your average poor peasant. So this guy, you know, could have been the leader uh, and made himself rich and lived in a big mansion, but he didn't do any of that. He did the opposite, uh, and that uh, generated more respect both from his own people, the Indian people, uh, and uh, the the British as well. Uh, he became popular in Great Britain itself. Uh, uh, amongst particularly workers uh, and factories and their you know their families, kids were writing essays about him at home and for school. Uh, and uh, he was and right the, the British government uh, wasn't wild about Gandhi because uh, they weren't keen on the idea of giving up their colony of India. Uh, and yet the the British people in, in some ways fell in love with this guy. Uh, but uh, uh, part of it was his sort of a shrewd uh, ability to kind of sell himself uh, as sort of a lawyer. Uh, uh, slash politician. So uh, he was a little bit the holy man uh, and not a phony one, but he also knew how to sort of make it uh, look good uh, and to sort of sell uh, what he was doing and the way he was doing it. Uh, Gandhi uh, uh, increasingly put pressure on the British through nonviolent, uh, non cooperation, sort of standing in the way uh, of projects that, uh, you know, they were protesting. Uh, there was the famous uh, Salt March. Uh, the British uh, controlled uh, salt mines uh, in India, uh, and as a sort of symbolic gesture uh, of uh, you know defiance, uh, he led a march uh, to the sea uh, uh, to uh, uh, essentially uh, draw uh, attention and support uh, to the idea uh, that uh, the British uh, need to go. He also uh, at times uh, fasted. Uh, when the British uh, would uh, uh, you know, undertake a policy that uh, he was against, his movement was against, uh, he would fast until they would uh, uh, 
sort of, you know, quit uh, in whatever they were doing. He organized boycotts of British goods. Uh, he uh, was the centerpiece of an entire campaign ongoing for homespun, uh, which meant that uh, don't buy British cloth and textiles any longer. Uh, Britain was the leading textile manufacturer in the world by this time. He, he's saying, uh, throw out your British-made clo clothing, burn it, uh, put it in bonfires, and get a spinning wheel and spin your own, which Gandhi did himself. This garment he's wearing here uh, uh, probably was homespun uh, itself. So the idea was to hit the British in the pocketbook uh, and also kind of pr you know, promote uh, a certain amount of sim simplicity uh, kind of the religious part of his persona, persona uh, and personality. Uh, so uh, uh, all of these things made him famous around the world, uh, and uh, uh, they played a role uh, in pushing the British sort of further and further kind of into a corner. Why would the British care if he was fasting? And he fasted for large amounts of time sometimes to the point where he couldn't walk. Uh, you know, he could barely lift his head. Uh, because uh, they didn't want him to be a martyr for the cause. Gandhi was so popular uh, with the Indian public, and a gigantic population in India, uh, that the British were always careful, rightly so, I think, uh, that they didn't uh, uh, do too many things that pushed Gandhi too far or harmed him or seemed to harm him. Uh, for fear that there'd be just massive bloody revolution, uh, uh, even though Gandhi was trying to right lead a uh, non-violent, non-cooperative uh, uh, opposition, not a violent one. Uh, but he was just so popular, they couldn't afford uh, to let him become a martyr. So every time he started to fast, they like roll their eyes, oh, here he goes again. Now what do we, now what do? We do? Uh, they'd often have to give in uh, uh, because uh, they knew what they were up against. Uh, if uh, he kept fasting and people uh, hear about it, and read about it in the newspaper, uh, Gandhi's now you know, weaker and weaker, uh, people are afraid he's going to die, uh, and they're going to take it out on you, uh, the British, and you're badly outnumbered uh, in this country if there ever was a violent, bloody revolution. Uh, by the time we get to uh, the years of the Great Depression, and just prior to World War II, uh, Gandhi's uh, and Nehru and the other leaders, uh, Jinnah's uh, movement, uh, had become uh, successful enough uh, that uh, it pushed the British uh, to uh, pass the uh, Government of India Act of 1937, uh, which is sort of part two of a related uh, piece of legislation uh, that came two years earlier, 1935. But this created an autonomous legislature uh, for uh, uh, the Indian people. Uh, so autonomous, again, didn't mean complete independence. Uh, this is home rule. This is the achievement of home rule. Uh, but it did mean that they're going to have their own elected representatives now, uh, and many, most of the government decisions now would be made uh, by uh, India's own legislature and own uh, politicians. On some of the big issues, uh, or sort of larger outside issues, particularly foreign policy and things like trade policy, that's where the British were still holding on to some power, uh, and India wouldn't be uh, free of you know British... Uh, uh, you know, uh, connections in that regard uh, until after World War II. But this is already close in terms of years since World War II ends in 1945. Uh, this brings us to uh, how Muslims fit into all this. Uh, Gandhi uh, was from a Hindu background, though he uh, believed that all religions uh, uh, more or less uh, were trying to achieve the same thing, so they weren't enemies of each other. Uh, not all religious leaders have thought that. Uh, but uh, the Muslim minority in India uh, uh, was concerned about some of these things because uh, it believed uh, it was underrepresented, at least at first. And so uh, there were Muslim fears, as it says here, of Hindu dominance. Uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah uh, became uh, the leader uh, of uh, the Muslims politically uh, in India uh, and formed something called the Muslim League. Uh, which was designed to protect the rights uh, of uh, the Muslim, again, minority uh, 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 in this country. But he went further than that. He eventually proposed uh, that once India becomes uh, independent, uh, it should split into two countries, uh, a Hindu India, 
uh, and a country to the in the north part of India uh, that uh, would become Pakistan uh, in in due course in its time. Uh, and Gandhi was against it, and many of the other leaders uh, uh, on on the Hindu side were against it. Uh, but in the end, uh, Jinnah. Uh, ended up getting what he wanted, uh, and uh, to this day, Pakistan uh, uh, and India are related by culture and ethnicity, uh, Indian, but one is a, a primarily Hindu country, though there are Muslims living in, in the borders of uh, uh, India, uh, and Pakistan is really an overwhelming uh, uh, Muslim country. So Jinnah uh, had to kind of fight hard politically uh, uh, to achieve these things, and it wasn't just him alone. This happened over a, a long period of time, uh, but uh, uh, he was an important part of it. And this is uh, Mr. Jinnah here. Uh, you see him pictured with Gandhi on the left, uh, and uh, uh, Gandhi uh, and Jinnah weren't always natural allies. Uh, uh, certainly there was some... Uh, abrasiveness, uh, you know, between uh, the leader of the uh, Hindu uh, community, the majority in India, uh, and the leader of the Muslim minority uh, in India, but uh, uh, they sort of worked together, uh, I think, as best as you could uh, under uh, very uh, high-pressure situations, and they did have something uh, in common, uh, which was they both desperately wanted independence from the British. Uh, as Professor Bentley says of uh, Jenna, that he was an eloquent and brilliant lawyer who headed the Muslim League uh, and warned that Uni a united India represented nothing less than a threat to the Muslim faith uh, and its Indian community. Uh, so uh, he painted sort of this in stark terms uh, that uh, a you know a united India uh, will just end up oppressing uh, Muslims because we'll be outnumbered by quite a bit. Uh, Stanley Walpert, in a book I've already uh, quoted, uh, said Jinnah's dynamic leadership helped inspire renewed confidence as he toured India, selecting Muslim members for a central parliamentary board designed to offer some political co cohesion to the many parties competing for the claim to represent India's 80 million Muslims. 80 million Muslims, uh, and uh, they're the uh, the, the minority. Uh, so uh, this is already a, a gigantic country, both in terms of uh, you know, geographic size uh, and uh, in terms of population. Uh, maps uh, and globes, uh, uh, the Mercator projection included uh, especially, uh, uh, tend to, because they can't ever make it completely, since the Earth is round, uh, they can't ever make a map completely accurate. Uh, and maps then tend to actually underplay the size of what's called the subcontinent uh, of India. Uh, so uh, it's an enormous uh, chunk of real estate. We now shift uh, uh, northward uh, to China uh, yet again. Uh, as uh, we already know, China looms large in our class, uh, is one of the centerpieces uh, of our study of world history uh, in the early modern and modern periods. Uh, and uh, uh, Bentley, uh, again, uh, tells us that during the first half of the 20th century, China was in a state of almost continual revolutionary upheaval. Uh, the conflict's origin stated from the 19th century, when the Chinese empire came under relentless pressure from imperialist powers, imperialist powers, I can't say it, uh, meaning European powers, and the United States, that rushed in to fill the vacuum created by China's political disintegration. So kind of both internal and external uh, forces uh, explain uh, China's very tumultuous uh, uh, politics uh, and society uh, during this period. So uh, with so much uh, civil strife and even civil war at home, uh, it allowed the Europeans and American uh, uh, you know, uh, governments and corporations to take even greater advantage of China uh, than they had before, and we already know they had been. Things like the uh, right, sale of opium, the opium war, the unequal treaties, etc. So the Chinese Republic uh, was born uh, after right uh, uh, centuries and centuries of China being a, basically a, uh, a monarchy, an absolute monarchy, uh, uh, but becomes a, a republic, uh, technically uh, a sort of democratic or semi-democratic form of government, it didn't always work out that way. Uh, and uh, our uh, beloved author says the revolution of 
1911 uh, did not establish a stable government. The Republic soon plunged into a state of political anarchy uh, and disintegration marked by the rule of warlords who were disaffected generals from the old imperial Chinese army, meaning when there was an emperor, uh, and their troops. While the central government in Beijing ran the post office and a few other services, the warlords established themselves as provincial or regional rulers. Uh, the continued sway of the unequal treaties and other concessions permitted foreigners to intervene in Chinese society. Foreigners didn't, again, meaning mostly the Europeans, foreigners did not control the state, uh, but through their privileges, uh, they impaired its sovereignty. So again, the Euro Europeans were able to take advantage of this new government's weaknesses, and it was pretty weak from the start. Uh, and the, the main internal uh, issue with regard to you know, blocking a, a more cohesive uh, Republican government uh, were the warlords uh, aforementioned, uh, which really meant that the Chinese uh, uh, Republic here, eventually under the Nationalist uh, Party, uh, uh, had a hard time centralizing power because these warlords are kind of local, regional, uh, uh, you know, uh, power figures with a regional base. So uh, they, they weren't able to the government wasn't able to easily uh, sort of uh, hold all of these uh, various warlords in different regions uh, sort of under their own sway, under their own power. So uh, when you can't force major leaders in different parts of your kingdom uh, you know, under your own thumb, you're not going to be an effective government in, you know, in, in many ways, if any. Chinese nationalism was growing uh, in this period, uh, partly because, again, of contact uh, uh, with uh, the Western European uh, world, with the United States, uh, just like their uh, neighbors to the south in India uh, and across the uh, ocean uh, a bit, the uh, Sea of Japan to Japan, which we're going to get to uh, in a bit. Uh, uh, Chinese nationalism uh, saw uh, the May 4th movement uh, in 1919, which were mainly uh, student protests uh, uh, at and of the Paris Peace Conference uh, of that year. Uh, you know, keep in mind or remember the Paris, Paris Peace Conference uh, was the conference that uh, negotiated treaties uh, ending World War I and figuring out how they're going to put the, the world back together politically, uh, uh, you know, geographically, uh, etc., uh, and uh, the uh, student movement here uh, uh, wasn't wild about the way uh, China was treated. Uh, Japan wasn't treated particularly well or didn't feel it was uh, uh, by the uh, peace uh, conference as well. Uh, another sort of nationalist uh, milestone, uh, a big one as it turned out in the end, was the formation of the Chinese Communist Party in 1921. Uh, and uh, to say that the uh, communists are, or nationalists in some ways is uh, a contradiction uh, because uh, communists have uh, generally uh, been known to uh, feel that their their comrades with communist parties in you know every other country that has a communist party nonetheless uh, in this case because China was in the spot that it was still uh, under the power uh, of multiple European uh, you know and Western countries, uh, the uh, Mao uh, uh, Zedong, uh, leader of the Communist Party, uh, uh, came to power not just trying to cr you know create a communist party and a communist country, uh, which took him a long time, uh, but also to oust uh, the foreign power and foreign influence. Uh, Mao uh, was a contributor to Marxist uh, thought and theory. Uh, his writings uh, are considered part of Marxist thought. Uh, and uh, he uh, had to figure out how to kind of apply Marxist uh, theory uh, to China uh, because China had some differences uh, that you know Karl Marx uh, you know, hadn't written about. He was writing about uh, a communist revolution in Europe uh, and in, in the more advanced countries of Europe economically at that. Even the Russians in the Russian Revolution, Lenin uh, did the same thing before Mao. Uh, by uh, uh, you know a, a, a number of years, uh, which is figure out how to apply Marxist ideas to Russia, because Russia uh, was sort of the least economically and technologically sophisticated of the European countries, 
so that uh, he had to figure out how to uh, 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 adapt, adjust Marxism uh, to Russia, and that's what Mao is now doing uh, in China. Uh, there was a civil war in the middle of uh, the 1920s uh, uh, as the two parties uh, kind of rose to power and came into existence at the same time. The Communist Party uh, and the Nationalist Party, led by uh, Sun Yat-sen that we'll see in a moment. Uh, and for a time, uh, they uh, were uh, allies. It was not an easy alliance because they had lots of disagreements uh, ideologically, philosophically, etc., uh, but they uh, rallied together for a time to try to uh, subdue by force uh, the warlords that were causing so much problem uh, for the you know new republican government uh, in centralizing uh, you know and uh, getting uh, obedience uh, you know, to its own authority uh, so uh, the civil war started uh, in 1925 uh, and uh, about 10 years later uh, came an astonishing event called the Long March, where the communists uh, sort of decided to regroup. Uh, they were under uh, a great deal of pressure militarily and economically. Uh, and so they made this forced march all the way across uh, China uh, uh, to give themselves sort of breathing room to be able to kind of come back uh, and renew the fight later on. Uh, and the communists don't take power in China until 1949, uh, right? Uh, the Communist Party took uh, was formed in 1921. They uh, started a civil war with the Nationalist Party, which eventually became the government, as we'll see. Uh, but it wasn't until 1949, which is four years after the end of World War II, that the Communist Party itself, under Mao, uh, uh, finally took, uh, took control uh, and uh, gained power and became the government of China, which it still is today. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, uh, is still in power today. It's the same uh, the government uh, that sort of you know was originally laid down by Mao and fought uh, uh, you know uh, to get itself into power uh, by Mao uh, and uh, his uh, many disciples. Uh, which brings us to uh, the uh, Chinese leader uh, who became, uh, uh, once he took power uh, in 1949, uh, became uh, one of the most destructive dictators in all of world history uh, in terms of the number of people uh, killed or whose deaths he was responsible for. Uh, he's right up there with Hitler and Stalin. Uh, 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 right? We've already met Stalin, uh, and we're going to come across Hitler, unfortunately, soon enough. Uh, but Mao's uh, reckless uh, and uh, you know uh, utopian policies and his ruthlessness saw uh, tens of millions of Chinese uh, killed uh, in one way or another uh, during his uh, period uh, in power. Again, from 1949, he died in 1970, 76. There he is there, uh, 75 or 76. Uh, so uh, Mao himself uh, said uh, at one point. For many years, we communists have struggled for a cultural revolution uh, as well as for a political and economic revolution, and our aim is to build a new society and a new state for the Chinese nation. That new society and new state will not only uh, will not ha will have not only a new politics and a new economy, but a new culture. In other words, not only do we want to change a China that is politically oppressed and economically exploited into a China that is politically free and economically prosperous, we also want to change the China which is being kept ignorant and backward under the sway of the old culture into an enlightened and progressive China under the sway of a new culture. In short, we want to build a new China. Our aim in the cultural sphere is to build a new Chinese national culture. Well, that all sounds nice uh, uh, if you sort of don't know what to look for. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I've been doing this for so long, I know what to look for, uh, and this is actually a scary statement. Uh, though we might have a clue to this, what to make of this quote, uh, if we think back to, say, the French Revolution, which we studied, uh, seems like years ago now, does it not? Uh, but remember that the French revolutionaries wanted to totally change their culture, uh, sort of just throw away everything about the French past, 
uh, and try to kind of completely replace the old, uh, uh, you know, uh, part and parcel with the new. Uh, and uh, I said at the time, and historians argue about this even now, but plenty of them uh, uh, you know, uh, say uh, that uh, it's a foolhardy thing to do. Uh, changing a society is one thing, but completely throwing away your past uh, and uh, trying something you know totally new, untried, untested, uh, you know anywhere in the world uh, is uh, you know, uh, uh, taking a big risk. Uh, and guess what happened? Uh, the uh, things that he, Mao, and his government tried after 1949 uh, were disastrous, uh, killing millions of people, which we'll eventually get to. Uh, in another u uh, another unit uh, uh, after World War II, uh, so uh, th this really is utopian, uh, and the, the the most dangerous kind of utopian thinking, uh, and the results then are sort of predictable uh, once uh, you sort of read this quote and are able to kind of uh, you know decipher it and kind of translate it, uh, translate it from kind of the political mumbo jumbo or you know kind of happy sounding uh, uh, statement that it is. It's really not that. Sun Yat-sen uh, was the leader of the Nationalist Party. Uh, again, the Communist Party and the uh, Guomindang or the Nationalist Party were friends and allies for a while. Alliance of convenience, as it says. Uh, uh, but uh, then turned bitter enemies and they're the ones who sort of fought it out for control of China over uh, you know, the decades between 1925 and 1949. Uh, Sun Yat-sen, uh, uh, as Bentley says, was the most prominent nationalist leader at the time uh, and did not share the communist enthusiasm for a dictatorship of the proletariat and the triumph of communism. Sun's basic ideology, summarized in his Three Principles of the People, a piece of writing that I should have put in italics there, uh, essay, uh, called for elimination of special privileges for foreigners, national reunification, uh, which meant putting the warlords down and, you know, forcing the Chinese public sort of, you know, under the rule of one government, uh, economic development, modernization, industrialization, and a democratic Republican government based on universal suffrage. Uh, and that all sounds nice as well. Uh, and I would argue that, uh, at least in theory, uh, what uh, this ideology was promoting uh, was far better, uh, would have been far better for China uh, than uh, what the communists were proposing. Unfortunately, uh, there were still huge problems uh, with the Nationalist Party's leadership, uh, and they were never able to sort of really uh, achieve uh, the objectives that you know that they claimed they were going to. Uh, Sun Yat-sen himself said, the Chinese people have only, uh, have only family and clan solidarity. They do not have national spirit. They are just a heap of loose sand. Other men are, car are the carving knife and the serving dish. We are the fish and the meat. Uh, meaning we're getting carved up uh, like fish and meat uh, and sort of just being thrown around like we're uh, sort of helpless uh, by uh, a more powerful uh, you know, countries like Britain uh, and Germany and the United States. After Sun Yat-sen died, uh, his uh, loyal lieutenant uh, and able lieutenant Chiang Kai-shek uh, came to power uh, and was the uh, uh, leader of the Nationalist Party uh, when it made the decision, meaning he primarily made the decision uh, to uh, uh, end the alliance uh, with the communists and Mao uh, and start a civil war you know, rivaling each other for uh, the ultimate goal, which is you know, achieving power and control over the government. Uh, Bentley says toward the end of his successful campaign in 1927, uh, Chang brutally and unexpectedly turned against his former communist allies, bringing the alliance, alliance of convenience between the uh, Guomindang, the nationalists, and the CCP, Communist Party, to a bloody end. Nationalist forces occupied Beijing, set up a central government in Nanjing, and declared the uh, uh, Guomindang, uh, or nationalists, the official government of a unified and sovereign Chinese state. Uh, w. Scott Morton, uh, in a book I've quoted before on China, uh, says those who were resident in the China of the 1930s, so uh, in the next decade, uh, remember actually the relief and enthusiasm with which Chiang Kai-shek was welcomed. 
Uh, by contrast with the grim period which went before, uh, support for Chiang was widespread in China. The nationalist decade of the 30s at least started with high hopes and, and actually achieved a great deal. Uh, the author quoted there uh, believes that some historians go too far uh, in making the Chinese Republic under nationalist leadership, under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek, uh, uh, sort of out to be a total disaster uh, when uh, he, he claims that there were successes in there too. But there's no doubt uh, that once the Civil War happened, uh, started between the nationalists and uh, the communists under Mao, that uh, it sort of put China as a whole under a great strain, and then came World War II, uh, which put the country even under greater strain. As I mentioned at the outset of the section here on China, uh, the Communist Party uh, trying to kind of get away uh, uh, from the nationalist uh, uh, government's forces, uh, which are trying to destroy the Communist Party because they're now rivals and enemies of each other. Uh, but uh, Mao and his uh, lieutenants, deputies, decided we have to sort of go somewhere to regroup and we need to get as far away as we can, though still in China. But uh, in China, you can go a long ways and still be in China. Uh, the Long March in 1934-1935 is legendary uh, in Chinese Communist Party history uh, to this day. And on the left, you see a rather melodramatic kind of propaganda piece type painting. On the right, uh, you see uh, an actual photograph of a gathering uh, of the party uh, during the Long March. Uh, quoting from Professor Morton, who I just quoted moments ago, the Long March, by any reckoning, ranks as one of the great military exploits and a fantastic example of human endurance. Those on the march covered 6,000 miles in just over a year, crossed 24 rivers and 18 mountain ranges, five of them under permanent snow. They passed through 12 provinces and occupied 62 cities. There were 15 pitched battles and a skirmish of some sort almost daily uh, with nationalist uh, government forces. The average distance covered on marching days was nearly 24 miles per day. Uh, and these weren't just soldiers. Uh, they were uh, the families uh, of soldiers. Uh, so this was, in a sense, the whole Communist Party membership and their families uh, moving 6,000 miles across uh, uh, China from one part to another, uh, again, to try to get away from the nationalist forces so they can kind of regroup and counterattack. And amazingly, they did. Uh, it took uh, years to make the kind of counterattack, at least uh, uh, the one that succeeded in 1949, uh, but uh, this probably saved uh, Mao's party uh, to live uh, and fight another day. Uh, so uh, it, it was remarkable what was achieved here. Uh, although, uh, considering uh, the destruction that Mao ended up, uh, you know, bringing to China after 1949, uh, maybe the Long March would have been uh, would have been better if it had failed. Uh, uh, at any rate, about 90,000 uh, began the march, and only about 30,000 survived, uh, which isn't uh, enough, particularly in a place like China, uh, to take over the government, especially by force. But uh, being uh, far, far west in China of the capital. Uh, over the years, they were able to then convert more and more people uh, in such provinces uh, uh, to uh, uh, communist ideology. So their numbers rose again because of that after they kind of got away.